Uh, I'm going to turn my camera off just so I don't take any, up any more of the of the screen here. So I want to uh, welcome everybody back. This is um, our first referee and umpire training session. We had a successful launch last week with the uh, with the introduction and our, like I said, our initial online training. So uh, I wanted to thank everybody who joined in last week. Um, like I said, I think it was a pretty successful launch with over 155 people. So that was good. Uh, I want to welcome any new members that are on, any new recruits. This is the way we're going to be doing training for for the time being. So if you're here, welcome. Um, and if you're watching the replay, you know, also since we have the capability now, uh, we have uh, our YouTube channel, which you can go to off of our website. Just go to the upcoming event section, click on any date, and you can review any of the previous recordings. Um, just a few things uh, for tonight. Like I said, it's going to be geared primarily to referees and umpires. Uh, leading the training is going to be Robert Frazier. He's a MEAC referee. Mike Cooper, he's a Big 12 umpire. Jeremy Epps, uh, he is in the CFO West. And uh, Jeff Wasserman, who has been a referee in our chapter for 20 years. And I think this is your seventh year as a White Hat. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So um, that's it for the presentation, for the introduction, guys. So I'm just going to turn it over to you guys now. I'm going to shut my, my microphone and my camera off and I'll be monitoring the chat. Okay. So good evening, guys. I, I'll, I'll echo what uh, Xavier said. Thank you guys very much for, for kicking off uh, this first session. Although the session is titled Referees and Umpires, one of the things I would encourage you to, especially crew chiefs and referees, is to uh, make plans to be here each and every week. Uh, uh, to be an effective crew chief, I think it's not only important that we understand our role and our, our uh, mechanics uh, backwards and forwards, but it's also to be able to coach and to, to lead a, a crew, um, it's very important that you understand uh, and have expectations of where everyone else will be. Um, so we'll get started tonight. I'm going to kick off this first slide and turn it over to, uh, to Jeremy and to Jeff. We'll kind of just talk. And this is, you're going to see this, uh, this is kind of walking through the sequential portions of the, uh, of the game. We're talking about the pregame. We'll go to free kicks in the, um, and then the running game tonight. And then, and a few weeks we'll have, we'll pick it back up with a referee and umpires with a passing game and also uh, scrimmage kicks and then kind of a miscellaneous. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn over to Jeff and to Jeremy. Thanks, Robert. So uh, starting with pre uh, preparing for the game day, I like to watch and make comments in the previous mm -hmm. week's game film with the crew. So mm -hmm. I usually get the game film from the coach uh, Monday, Tuesday, I'll watch well, you know, 150, 200 plays, make comments on them, send an email and make uh, comments on relevant plays for everybody, get some feedback, and I'll often bring it next week to the game, and sometimes we'll even watch some film on a laptop from the previous week. I like to look at Dallas Morning News, see if there's anything big about uh, the teams or the coaches in particular that might be uh, written. It's always useful to know about some of the players. Uh, on occasion, I might contact the referees who had the teams the previous week or weeks and find out if there's anything you need to know about formations or, or whatever might be useful. Uh, I usually read one chapter of a rule book a week or read referee magazine. Sometimes if you guys don't have it, it's good to have, you get a tassel membership, you get it uh, every month, including off season, they'll have a football section. And I think the case plays in there are really good to use. And some of the articles are, even though there's a lot of high school stuff on there, they're really useful. And I do email both coaches uh, during the week, usually on Tuesday, just to introduce myself and the crew, tell them what time we're going to be arriving and ask them to notify us if there's going to be a change in uh, game time or anything relevant we need to know. I always copy Ty and the president on that email so there's no uh, conflict uh, issue. And only one time did I actually get a response from a coach who wanted a, a ruling, and I just sent that up to Ty and the president and let them handle it from there. And you know, they let me know what they decided so I could talk to the coach about it, but I didn't get involved in anything more than that. As far as travel and arrival time, uh, the umpire and your crew should make the travel arrangements. Uh, the head linesman's the backup for the pregame conference, and he also checks on the chain crew and uh, makes sure, confirms they're going to be there. 
Uh, we will carpool if the game is pretty distant, like Denison or whatever. But otherwise, we should go ourselves. But that's going to be up to every crew and where everybody lives and, and all those details. Uh, the crew should arrive at the locker room, in my opinion, at least two hours before game time. Get dressed and start your pregame conference. Uh, no, um, no more than an hour and a half before kickoff. Uh, usually for pregame conferences, uh, I'll bring some case plays. We'll look at some game film from the previous week. Uh, I like to get the chain crew involved. Uh, I do have cards. I have laminated cards that I made up, and I bring them every week, and I hand them out to the crew so they can actually run the conference to get everybody involved. And uh, I'd like to say they love the cards, but this is a picture in 2008 where my umpire took my card box and put it underneath the car tire. So not sure they love them, but it's it works. And uh, they don't know it yet, but I'm going to make another 100 for this year. So I'll, I'll get the last laugh on this one. Anyway, make it interactive. Whatever you do, just, just get everybody involved. Just don't sit, stand there and lecture them. Uh, and look, for a few hours, you just need to get your mind off your family, off the job. Talk football. Um, it's part. It's one of the pleasures of doing this. We get to just escape everything for a few hours. Uh, for the pregame coaches conference and walking the field, I like to get on the field 60 minutes before uh, kickoff. Um, I believe the uh, TASA requires 30 minutes. I usually do 60. I think the NCAA is going to be discussing going to 90 minutes or when both teams are on the field, but that's yet to be decided yet. And I, I don't think the UIL is going to make a change. And uh, Bruce uh, Tiff doesn't think they will either, but uh, it's a couple of weeks till that meeting till we know for sure. Uh, walk the field as a crew, check the pylons, check your communication system. I think we all have one now and check your microphone, be sure it's working. So if you have to change batteries or do something else, you know, fix the feedback, you can do it in plenty of time before game time. Uh, as far as meeting with the coaches, Usually we'll, after we get the sheet with the uh, equipment attestation and the uh, captains, find out who the ball boys are going to be, who are get back coaches, uh, find out if they're going to do any unusual plays that could fool us, uh, make sure we don't get an invert whistle. Uh, did they see anything on game film about the other team that they'd like to talk to us about? Mm -hmm. It's okay to listen to what they have to say. That's, that's a good form. Uh, I let them know I'm usually going to meet them between periods. I'm going to rotate back and forth. So there'll plenty of time during the game to discuss issues with me, but that the, uh, the wings do have communication devices. So if they need numbers or details on fouls, we can always get it to them uh, at timeouts. Uh, I want to know about the quarterback. Is he right or left-handed? I want to know a little bit about their punter. I'll watch him in the pregame warmup though and see how, how far they seem to be kicking. Do they want the ball? Where do they want the ball placed after free kicks? If you ask them, they'll usually tell you, hey, we like it on the left hash, the right hash, or just right down the middle. That way they don't have to keep on telling you throughout the game. Do they do a swinging gate? If they do, is the center eligible? Uh, if it's uh, conference play, uh, talk about positive points real quick. Uh, timing location of the coin toss. That's key. Obviously, you're going to do it beforehand. You know, it used to be it was probably about 50-50. Now it's 80, 90 percent of the time we'll do the cost, uh, toss beforehand. And I let them know I want the team out in the field usually about eight minutes before kickoff. If you just let if you're too general about that and you let them decide they come out whenever. I like to be very precise. So if you got a 730 kickoff, say, coach, please get your team out by 722. And they're usually pretty good about doing that because you want to get the captains uh, for the toss about 726 or so for a 730 game. Uh, when we uh, walk the field, when we come out of locker room, again, check the pylons, look for any hazards. If you find anything you need to talk to the uh, athletic director, you've got time to get that done. Uh, after the coaches meeting, I usually join back judge at the center of the field. Uh, just to have two officials there. I like to watch the quarterbacks on both sides, get, get an idea what they're going to be like, watch some of the key receivers. Then I usually walk around to the other officials who are usually taking snaps on both sides of the field and, you know, ask them if they see anything about equipment or anything else I need to be aware about. Uh, Robert, you want to go to the next slide on coin toss? Oh, you All didn't right. get that slide? Yeah. Okay, well, let me, let me talk about the coin toss. And I sent you a slide. You didn't get it in there. So with a seven-man crew, I take a position usually on the 45 facing the main scoreboard. Uh, the uh, umpire will be opposite from me. Uh, usually be four minutes before kickoff. I'll ask the captains to be there. Uh, I don't let them bring in any objects. So if they've got flags or a big hammer or whatever, 
have him keep it at the uh, uh, nine yard marks. And I asked the uh, side judge and field judge to watch for that. Uh, Tassel does give us the option if we did the coin toss beforehand that we can bring the teams directly out in the 49 with their back facing the end zone they'll be defending. I've tried that a couple times this year. Personally, I didn't like it. I like kind of the more traditional way where their uh, backs are facing their sideline and I have them turn around based upon the results of the toss, but uh, you can do either one. Uh, if I'm mic'd up, I don't like to do the whole toss live. Um, I just, I don't think that we should be taking up five minutes of time on the microphone and you know, the PA announcers always seem to have a lot to do before the game. Um, Although after the toss is done and I line the players up, I will turn on my mic and discuss the results of the coin toss. That's the way I like to do it, but you can do it a uh, different way if you choose to. Uh, usually I'll make a quick statement like the team A won the toss and defer to the second half. Team B will receive the kick defending the south end zone. Something quick and simple and get it done. Okay, next slide, Robert. Hold on. Oh, I'm sorry. I think you want to talk about walking the field, right, Jeremy? Yeah, let me talk about walking the field real quick. I know. Walking the field at the umpire position. Yeah. Uh, before, I, before I go on to say that, uh, I think it's important and very imperative that every member of the crew has something that they're looking at during the walking of the field. So usually in uh, my uh, – usually with me, my referees – they have a specific duty for everybody to uh, look for. So whether it be visors or uh, streamers, uh, somebody or everybody should be looking at something specific. And maybe you'll be doing that with a, a teammate. So uh, usually uh, I'll be looking at visors with the back judge and then the head and the uh, uh, judge will be looking at something uh, different. Uh, during my walk in the field, if there's a cast, usually a coach will come up to me and have me check the cast. After I check out if it's good or bad, I go talk to the center, starting centers for both teams. When I'm talking to both uh, centers for both teams, I'm getting their names, their first names, and I'm telling them that, hey, I'm Coach Epps. Uh, I'm going to be working with you today. Uh, I'll go over my expectations with him as far as uh, substitution goes. I think we have some substitution slides uh, later. I uh, also ask him, hey, man, if we have any funny business throughout the game or during the game, who can I talk to? Who can I lean on? So uh, you want to be vocal, vigilant, and you don't want to talk with your flag. I think that's something that Michael Cooper uh, told me a long time ago. You don't want to have a flag party throughout the game. You want to use your voice and use your body throughout the game. Uh, after I talk to the center, I go to uh, look at the uh, defense, and I take a look and see what the defense has. Uh, once I look at the defense, I ask uh, one of the coaches, who's uh, the captain of the defense? Because when we tend to have any scuffles, we usually lean and try to talk to the offense. We need to talk to the offense and the defense. So once I talk to that defensive captain, you know, I give him my expectations of the game. I say, hey, man, if you have any, you know, funny business, I'm going to be leaning on you. I'm going to be talking to you throughout the game uh, just so, you know, we can speak about uh, an issue instead of having a UNS or UNR, especially on uh, anything sketchy or anything uh, not UNR or UNS worthy. Uh, once I do that, uh, I pretty much look at the offense, look at the uh, guard play, look at the center snap, and uh, that's pretty much my walk in uh, the field uh, for the 60 minutes during uh, the pregame. Coop, you got anything to add? Yeah, uh, well, I don't really have anything to add. I, I just would, would like to uh, make sure uh, that we stay consistent as a chapter, and if you guys don't mind, I, I would like to address something, even what Jeff said, and because Jeff was like 30 minutes before, but his crew liked to be out there 60 minutes before, and I'm thinking that if it's two, two a player from each team out there, we need to have someone out there. Uh, the other thing that I would also like for you guys to uh, <clears throat> to uh, start considering 
so you don't start uh, mixing things up. It's like because uh, Jeff used the saying, the team wanted the team on the left hash or right hash or whatever. Well, I'm an umpire, and I know I'm slow, and probably most other umpires are just as slow as I am. So we like to use numbers or else come up with something. Make sure you come up with something on your crew so you'll know. Because if you look talking about the left hash from the offensive side, that's not the hash the umpire is going to understand the left hash to be. So that uh, ideally we want to use numbers. We normally use numbers in those situations. And it's not a college thing, guys. It's just being consistent. And the consistency is, is that you want to create positions on the field from teams. And those positions are positions one, two, three, four, and five, meaning that one is closest to the press box um, on that hash and five being the furthest away and three being dead in the middle and nowhere two and four would be. So I just wanted to throw those things out there. And also uh, on the coin toss, I like what Jeff was saying, but just so we could be consistent as a chapter, I think we should take all the information, then turn on the mic and present it. That way everyone will be consistent. Uh, uh, Xavier might want to address how you guys want to do that. But I, I just think you guys need to be as consistent uh, doing things as possible because consistent brings about uh, fundamentally sound and that way no one is trying to be their own individual. Okay, Jeremy, you want to start with that? Yeah, free kick. So uh, we'll be opposite the press box. Uh, and I want to really put some emphasis in this. When we are on the, uh, the kicking team restraining line, we need to be on the back of the white. The back of the white. I think I probably was at a camp or a scrimmage. I think I was on the front of the white. Might have been Coop or Mike Prowl or somebody. And they told me, say, hey, boy, what you doing, you know, that close? To the, you can't see anything at the front of the white. They said, get at the back of the white so you can see everything, so you can make good judgments on any OFK. Uh, so we'll be on the back of the white. Uh, on each kick, I tell my guys, I say, hey, man, let's do a good job of staying on side on every kick. Be to me, OFK is a, a, a cheap foul. It's something that you can incorrect a lot. Uh, so you really, really, really want to see that foot, that complete body uh, over the line before the ball is kicked in order to have a, you know, a correct call on the OFK. Uh, not only calling my kick team, but also looking at the receiver team. Because uh, the last thing you, that you want to have happen in a free kick is to have 23 players out there and not nobody know, All right? Uh, once you get set, you signal to your back judge that, hey, man, we both have 11 guys, have four guys on each side, uh, and then allow the ball to be kicked. Uh, once it's kicked, if I have a big kick, a deep uh, goal line, I'm going to banana in, and if we're at the 40, I'll probably get to the 45 in between the uh, the hash marks and the numbers, and uh, I start to look at what I need to be keyed on. And uh, I think we're going to be talking about wedges. I'm not sure, but usually, and I think Robert and Jeff can, can, can attest to this, you may have a wedge towards the back where the, the referee or the short flanks might be looking. But uh, in some film that I looked at uh, last summer, a lot of the wedges happen where the back judge and the umpire will probably be looking at. It's those front groups of guys that tend, tended to, in years past, you know, get in groups of two or three within uh, shoulders width apart. So uh, that's something that we're definitely going to have to be uh, able to judge on. Uh, also looking at the kicker, making sure he's – free of five for those first five yards. Uh, kickers are doing a good job now. They just kick the ball and they kind of just jog towards their sideline. So, uh, you know, we still have to make sure he's free of five. But 
uh, he's getting out of the play pretty uh, early. Uh, Coop, you got anything to add? No, sir. Uh, Jeff? Yeah, so if this was a free kick after try, I'm going to review the score, and if, if it differs from what's on the scoreboard, I'm definitely going to chime in with the crew and make sure we've got got everything right. Uh, if it's an onside kick uh, scenario, I'm going to make the alignment call as soon as I can so the uh, crew can adjust for that. Uh, we go immediately into position. We don't do the old thing we used to do. We'd go to the 20, our line and split off. We just go right into the positions. Uh, I ask the wings to clear the sidelines as they go through. Everybody's real good about that. I'm sure everybody's doing that. Uh, the back judge should go out to the kicker at 45 seconds uh, after uh, the score. Uh, he'll hand the ball to the kicker after I signal him. So usually I'll use my comm device or just give him a thumbs up and you know, give the ball to the kicker. Then he'll uh, go back. Uh, to his position. Um, I whistle the ready for play once I've uh, counted the receiving team, check with the headlines and then the line judge. And I like to re uh, rely upon one person up front, the field judge or the side judge, to count the four officials up top, uh, be sure they're set uh, with their count on the kicking team, uh, put his hand up in the air, then I'll go ahead and uh, get the ready going. Uh, make sure you step out a little bit forward too. give a long blow on that whistle. Make sure the play clock operator and the kicker especially hears you when you blow that whistle because the crowd might be cheering. The band might be playing that part of the game, but you got to let them hear it or you just got to have a kicker staying there while you're waiting and the uh, play clock expires and uh, you don't want to call a delay. And we'll talk a little bit about that too. Check the play clock also before you blow it ready. Make sure the uh, play clock operator didn't start it early. Sometimes when you're giving hand signals to your other officials, the play clock operator thinks uh, you've wanted to wind the play clock. So if you didn't make it very clear, that can happen and you want to be able to reset it. Uh, as far as alignment goes, uh, I go to the middle of the end zone. I'll go to the goal line or maybe, maybe even up with the uh, deepest receiver if it's an onside kick formation. Uh, and again, blow that whistle real loud when you're ready to go so that the play clock operator and the kicker can hear you. Uh, don't let them kick it till they have 22 players. Uh, I think Jeremy mentioned that. Uh, and I think, you wanna talk about restraining line, Jeremy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm responsible for uh, the kicking team's restraining line. Uh, if we have an onside kick, that's a uh, play the flag. So if they're a little bit over that line, then, uh, we will have a flag. Uh, but like I mentioned before, uh, if we have a, a deep kick, uh, I want to see his full body over that uh, restraining line in order for it to be an OFK. Like I told you before, it's a cheap foul and uh, something that I've got burned on uh, a few times in the past. And uh, that's something that uh, as a chapter we can work on making sure we get those right. Uh, but like I said, if we communicate with our players throughout the game, whether it be on scrimmage plays, free kicks, and this particular thing, uh, if we talk to our guys and make sure, hey, you know, even if they weren't even really close to being offsides, I would tell them the next kick, i say, hey, man, you were a little bit close last time. Just uh, make sure you don't cross that line before the ball is kicked. And then that will stick in his mind throughout the game. And you should have a clean line. Uh, without any issues. Just make sure you use your voice uh, throughout the game. Uh, Jeff. Yeah, the only other thing that I'd note is, uh, just so the referees know, we are responsible for the play clock since we're looking head on to it. So make sure you've got an eye on it. Uh, and also, we also have to make sure that there's four more players on each side of the kicker when he kicks the ball. So keep an eye on that as they approach the ball to kick it. And if the uh, player in position to be the kicker doesn't end up kicking it. Sometimes some, uh, you, the inside player comes in and kicks it. Uh, that's a time you got to uh, take take an extra eye and count how many players were to the side of the ball. And also, if they do that, make sure you ask the back judge and umpire maybe after the play, hey, did the kicker go back more than five yards, right? Because you can only have one person more than five yards in the ball, and that has to be the kicker. So you want to make sure you didn't miss a, uh, uh illegal formation there. Uh, Robert, I think you're up next. Hey Jeff, I got a question. Yeah. I got a question yeah. before we go there. Hey, hey, hey Jeff. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, be, yeah. before, before the uh, because I heard when you were saying how your crew cleared the sideline. I know back 
in the day we used to meet up at the 25 yard line and then somehow some signal would come and the guys would clear that sideline to make sure that you know it's not you know i guess as the back judge is going out to hand the ball the other guys would come up and i was just wondering if you guys are still doing something similar to that to make sure no, we, and the other thing yeah, is, we don't mike uh, tasso changed that uh i think two or three years back saying that it's probably it's been long to be to me. i haven't been around in a while so i was just All wondering right. as, as to how you guys are going about making sure that we have that area clear for our guys to make sure they have a good, clean, safe workplace. Yeah, we, we don't get we don't get out meet. Everybody splits up and everybody knows they're supposed to clear the sidelines as they go up. And usually I'll even get on my comm device and say something. I'll say, make sure you clear the sideline, guys, as they're going up. Uh, so I think we're a lot, lot better about that as a chapter than we used to be certainly 10, 15 years ago. Uh, with all the emphasis that's been put on it. But yeah, we we don't meet anymore and then split up. Okay. Great. So so as as Jeff and Jeremy were talking about the leading up to the kick, what we're the what we're gonna show you now is just as the kick is is um prior to the kick. And so Jeremy, I'm gonna let you take the umpire, which is in the top left hand uh panel, if you will, and okay. take talk us through this and the movement here as just prior to then what the next slide will be during the kick will actually be the the umpire's next movement so just as he as as we're marked the ball ready for play what are you thinking what are you doing all right so uh, prior to the kick uh i'm in an athletic position i have one foot on the 40 yard line the my left foot 40 my right foot on the 41 uh Heat in on uh, the five guys that I see in front of me, uh, making sure they do not cross the ball before it is kicked. Like Jeff said, making sure they are in a legal formation, uh, foot on the line, and nobody's beyond uh, that five-yard uh, mark. Uh, after that, when the ball is kicked, I guess uh, we're going to talk about that in a minute. But uh, when the ball is kicked, I... I tend uh, I'm gonna do my banana and uh get set up and settled right at the between the fifty and forty five yard line. Jeff. Great. Yeah, and one one thing one thing here and in, in as we were putting this together, uh and Michael pointed out as we if we split if uh, I see a lot of guys and and coming up, I, I have to be honest, I, I was guilty of this, is that I would actually straddle the 40-yard line, which actually is an incorrect mechanic to, to really get guys to get the best angle, especially if we've got an onset. And this is a free kick away. You can tell, that, you know, but we don't ever know. They can have a, they can have a, they can have an onside kick that built me kick off. And heck, we saw it in the Super Bowl a few years ago uh, in the second half. But you can see that this official at the top, he is he's kind of an that's an old mechanic where he's straddling the line and this this official at the bottom is actually where we want you which he's got his left foot on the 40 and his right foot on the 41 we would want to mirror that on the top where we'd have the uh, the official's right foot on the 40 and his left foot on the 41 so that way we're actually seeing that in a true picture because you're straddling the line you're basically looking at the back of players after they've broken that plane instead of being out in front of that so Guys, that is one thing that is we just very, very small, but being consistent. So umpires, back judges, on that opening free kick um, and free kicks, make certain that instead of straddling the line, we've got our back foot on the on the restraining line, and that our front foot, the yard past that. All right. Again, it's just consistency, but it puts us in a better. And 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 what we're talking about tonight is a lot about just being having good angles and having our eyes in position to help us make the call. Coop, anything that you want to add to that? No, excellent. Excellent job. Very well put. Okay, great. So from the from the referee's perspective, um, you know, same thing like, like Jeff said. This is just prior to the kick. You've done your, your job. What I always do is I make certain with the headlines and the line judges that we've got 11 on the, on the receiving team. So I want a visual thumbs up, just like I'm a back judge. And so I'll put my left thumb up and I'll, and I'll signal to that official. I'll put my right 
and I won't I won't put them up until I get a visual. I won't put them down until I get a visual from that official, meaning that they're alert that they've actually done their counts. Uh, last thing we want to do is just guys is just to allow our line judge and head linesman just to give a rubber stamp. I mean, there's times where I think I've got 11 and I may have something other than that. And so if I if I have 11 and they're not certain about that, I don't want them sticking their thumb up there as though they they've got it. It's just like just like the back judge. But prior to the kick, the, the referee, like Jeff said, you know, uh, um, as far as, as spacing and uh, positioning, is that I want to be deeper than the, the deepest receiver. So if he's on the goal line, I'm going to be in the end zone, w- making certain that I keep him in my in my field of view and also up in front of him. We'll talk about that in just a moment. There's, there's, well, as we talk about this, the reason that we're doing that is that we there's we want to be able to see through the receiver and then on into that front line of, of blocks so that we can have a, a good visual on those. We don't have forward progress, so there's no reason whatsoever to really have our eyes glued on that, uh, that ball carrier once he becomes – after he's received the kickoff. A lot of times, um, referees, we want to we watch that ball carrier, and we've got two other officials who are responsible for forward progress. That's not us. So what we want to do is make certain that we are not officiating error, that we want to get our, our eyes up to where we can actually uh, be a, uh, a better official at officiating this play. Okay? So we've done our count. We've gotten, we've gotten 11. We've, we've looked at the uh, four on either side of the kicker. We've marked the ball ready for play, and now the ball is in the air. So during the kick, Jeremy's going to kind of take us through when the, during the kick what he's going to do, and then we'll have some, uh, some visuals on that as well. So, Jeremy, kind of during the kick. Yeah, so hey, during the okay, hey, go, go. Jeremy, quick course, quick thing before you go back. Robert, can you go back to the preview screen? Yeah, the, the, the first one up at the top. You see where the guy is on the 50 yard line? How he's at the he's at the uh back of the white. That's what we want the umpire in. We want him at the back. Because that's what Jeremy was talking about earlier. Yes, we want the umpire back there at the back too. Either his heels or toes at at, at the at the white, whichever to give him the best view. If, if that makes sense. That's great. all I want. Great, great point. Yeah, oh, great yeah. point. Yeah, if that ball if that ball comes your way, you you want to make sure you've got a good angle on that instead of being on top of the action. Yeah, go ahead, Jeremy. Yeah. So mechanics wise. Uh... We're going to be looking at the four and five, according to the mechanics manual. And I think we can help out with three. And so we're counting that outside in. So you have R1, R2, R3, R4, R5. Uh, Once that ball is kicked, we're looking at that first uh, wave. So like uh, in the picture, you see, I think that's about five guys standing at the 48. So like I said before, uh, if we have an illegal wedge, uh, that's something that we definitely should be looking at. Uh, once we get settled in, that's probably when we're going to get opposite colored jerseys, uh, uh, you know, uh, attacking each other. And then that's what we key in on. So we're going to be looking in front of the actual run. We're not going to be looking at the ball. We do not want to be ball watchers. Uh, we are looking for block below the waist, holds, blocks in the black, block in the backs, uh, those type of calls. Uh, but we're the the way it's set up, we're splitting uh, the field in sevens, right? So the back judge has the area he's looking at. I do uh, the B, the F, the H, the L, and the R. Uh, we're all responsible for a certain piece of the field, and. Uh, that piece of the field is uh, what we should be looking at. And uh, if anything, uh, if any foul occurred in our zone, we should uh, for sure 110% make sure we have eyes on anything illegal in our zone. Uh, Jeff, uh, referee. So, yeah, so from the, from the alignment hey, standpoint, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. No, go ahead, Robert. No, I was just going to say, I think it's important that that like like Jeremy said that keying off of the 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 umpire and the back judges to be able to get that action that's in that first wave. Um, that's really important that you know we 
every, everyone has their everyone has their their area their zone to be working in, and that that referee, excuse me, that umpire and back judge having that first wave frees up the side judge and the field judge, and so they're already beginning to look in kind of that that second wave down about the 30 yard line. So you guys have that all that action uh, right as it's that first wave, that first mesh. Um, right around the you know the 50 yard line, so it's really important that the umpire back judge really key in on that, and then let the play, you know, happen and, and occur. So go ahead, Jeff. No, I was gonna say you were gonna discuss uh, the zone concept too, but yeah, yeah. This this next this next uh, this next slide after after this, well, I'll get to the zone on that. Um, I think it's important that we have we've actually got a picture on that. We'll talk talk about the, the zones themselves. So we want to talk about kind of prior from a referee's perspective. We've talked about the, the counting of the players. Make sure we've got 22. We did. Now yep. on the on the on the on the on the zone concept, what we're what we're doing, and let me just kind of flip through this next slide. Excuse me, guys. <clears throat> when the when the when the play happens and the kick happens, if we all if the referee is putting his eyes right on the ball carrier. Look at all this action that's happening here. There's nothing that's going to happen to that ball carrier. He's made the he's made the reception. Referees, we want to get your eyes up the field and looking at about the 25 yard line. So as soon as we know that the ball is not going to be fair tied, it's not going to be untouched by B into the end zone where we have a touchback. Work on getting your eyes up to this level and then find what you know the 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 hot spot. Right now, we've got a couple of potential hot spots, but we've got eyes, the, the line judge or, or field uh, uh, headlinesman, excuse me, the headlinesman or line judge, whoever's in this right side has probably this. The other official, depending on where we've got forward progress, he has forward progress and he might begin to get a peak here, but there's nothing happening here. These guys are not engaged, so let this one go. What we start seeing is that with everyone's having their, their, eyes where they should be. We've got a potential low block here. We've got nothing here. We've got something that's a potential point of attack and a potential low block. And then we've got engagement here. So guys, it's talking about the zone. Make certain that you know where you should be looking. But for tonight, referees, work on getting your eyes up the field and not concentrating so much on this ball carrier, the, re the returner, because we've got help. We've got forward progress help. With the line judge and headlines. Hey, Robert. Okay. Robert. Yes, sir. Can I put something in there that, that I think that will be beneficial for guys? Hey, guys, if you know the color of the receiving team, which in this case is red, that's the potential fouler. So right now we got 27, so that would be either the back judge or the uh, umpire that we would have a potential blocking the bag. So if you don't know those colors, it's impossible for you to possibly uh, officiate this play in a correct way. So get in the habit of learning what the color is of the receiving team. Uh, so because that's the team that's more likely to foul. That's not the only team that could foul, but it's the most likely. It's just like on a, a change of possession. You want to know who's most likely to foul, and if you identify with the color, you're that much further in advance of uh, getting the play correctly officiated. Good, good point, Michael. And Jeremy, just this kind of illustrates, I think, what you were talking about. So the the the, the kick has just happened. So this is going to be your your loop in, and then you're going to be watching the, the the number four and five here as as play material takes takes off. Correct. Yeah, so okay. uh, especially during the return, I forgot to add this. Uh, once Team B player has the ball, we want to be settled in and we want to be stationary. We don't want to be running when the ball is in the field of play. So once we banana in and we get settled, we're stationary, that's when the play, that's when Team B uh, probably want to be receiving the kick. And when we are stationary, that's when we can make, uh, make uh, the best decisions possible in order for uh, whether there's a foul or not. If we're jogging, I think maybe Cooper, Cooper Mike Proud told me this, when you're jogging, your eyes are moving, you're, they're up and down, 
and uh, you can make some incorrect judgments and some incorrect calls opposed to being stationary and uh, getting where you need to be. But always hustle, don't hurt. You don't want to sprint to a spot. You want to move with, uh, you know, preciseness, but you do not want to sprint to a spot. My apologies, Rob. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. Great discussion, Jeremy. Wait, you know, wait. One, of, one of the things I wanted to point out is, go ahead, too. Oh, okay. I was going to, because Jeremy, you, uh, I don't take for granted. I don't know who's, uh, I see there's 99 plus people. I don't know who's on, who's in that plus or whatever. And so I would think if you say you banana out there, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm just being honest about this approach. And I, I want to make sure guys getting what they need to get in here. Okay. So when you say you banana out there, what exactly, what, when you say you banana out there, what exactly are you saying? So Robert, help me out because I, I have the cursor. So yeah, at the umpire position, I'm going to, a banana that was split, I'm going to go an angle to get to, let's say right now, uh, between the 50, uh numbers and the hash mark so that's where i want to get settled okay. right in that spot right there so what will make me i want to make sure because if, if i'm gonna use that term banana that's not my term i want to use in this situation and i don't want to uh get officials mixed up when we start using this word later on down the field i think we i think in the tasso mechanic book it speaks of you die, you angle out to that angle spot. That's and and so you just dive in. If, if if I'm wrong, tell me guys, but I think you dive in, which meaning that you're gonna come from if you're coming from the 40, you should be coming in probably to somewhere between the 45 and 50. And like you're saying, then you set up and start officiating. That works. Okay. I don't want it to work. I just want to make sure everybody is on the same page. It's not about if it'll work. It's about all of us being on the same page and understanding. And there's some young guys here, and I just want to make sure they get everything okay. that they get. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good discussion. I think obviously you don't want to be behind, you know, so that you can appreciate the play coming behind the uh, the kicking team and and work that work that play. Um, this. This bottom in the right hand side is really the same. I think it is really just um, uh, emphasizes and illustrates the importance of this um, official here. Does a good job of keeping his eyes up. As you can see, it's the same return as we showed before. It's just a higher view. But the the good eyes on this block or this area here, which is really the first potential threat. Actually, this in this play, this this player here from the kicking team actually makes a low block on this player, and and we picked this up because we had our eyes in the right place. Had we been ball watching, that that play could have this this block could have really gotten lost. So referees make certain that you keep your eyes up to the uh, potential threats, keep them there, and then your eyes the the uh, will, will take you you know kind of to that action. So. Be scanning, and then once you pick up where the action you believe the action should be, as the ball gets there, stay on that, stay on that block. Don't don't watch the ball. All right. So Jeff, you want to talk about and Jeremy uh, after the kick? Well, you want to go back uh, to slide that says during the kick. You want to go back a little bit, one more. Go back again. There you go. So uh, moving down, uh, I think we caught we talked about uh, trying not to. Uh, call delay a game on the kicker if he doesn't hear us just reset it and have the back judge you know talk to him through your comm device make sure you've got more than four players each side of the kicker our responsibility as referee is the end line uh, deep wedge formations I think Jeremy alluded to that a lot of the wedges will be up front but we'll get some in the, the back too and remember if they're lined up if they're stacked that's not a wedge formation. They got to be shoulder to shoulder within two yards. And it's got to be intentional. If you got two guys blocking and they just get pushed back or fall back and end up next to each other, you don't have a, a wedge formation there. And uh, as Robert was saying, keep your eyes ahead when the run begins. For a fair catch inside the 25 yard line, uh, 
a muff, if the uh, receiver muffs it, then catches it, you've got nothing, and that ball is going to go to 25. That's good. And by the way, it's got to go to midway between the hash marks. So the, the zone number three, uh, what Mike was saying, uh, not if the ball hits the ground, though. So if he muffs it and the ball hits the ground and then recovers it, plays dead, but it's going to be at that yard line where he covered it. Or if he muffs it and it bounces up in the air and another player gets it, he's still going to blow it dead, but the ball is going to be placed at the spot where the first player called the fair cat. So that may work for or against them. Uh, and by the way, an invalid signal is okay. It doesn't matter. They still get the ball to 25, even if the signal was invalid. Um, let's see. Um, okay, interesting case scenario. There was an uh, AR about this. What if the player who calls for the fair catch is out of bounds at the time he calls for it, or he calls for the fair catch, then steps out of bound, and then reestablishes himself when he ma makes the catch. Uh, just so you guys know, that's okay, all right? There's no rule against a receiving team member being out of bounds. So I actually had uh, almost had that happen this year. Guy called for fair catch with a foot right near the uh, sideline. As long as he's not out of bounds when he catches the ball, we're okay, and, and nothing's going to be unusual about it. Uh, some other un uh, rules unique to fair catch, kick out of bounds, Lateral position. So if they kick the ball out of bounds and it goes out the sideline, where are you going to spot that ball? It's going to be at that hash mark, right? It doesn't go midway. It goes at a hash mark. I think a lot of people erroneously put it in the middle field when that happens. Uh, options for your kick out of bounds. As you know, you get five yards in a re-kick. Uh, you get five yards from a dead ball spot, or you get 30 yards from the restraining line. Just be aware if your restraining line had been moved by a penalty, before that kick, you want to make sure you take that into account. And I think there's a slide about it later on. But when you go to the coach to give him the options, just give him two options. Say, coach, you can re-kick it or you can take the ball here and tell him where that is. Don't, don't bother going through all three options. They just want to know what their options are. So you can just go ahead and give them the best of those, that second and third option. Uh, let's see. what Somebody, if they want to chime in the chat room, what is the signal, okay, for a wedge formation? Maybe I want to take a guess at what that is. It's an unsportsmanlike conduct, though. So, and what, now what if you have a, uh, what happens if you have someone go up, a defender or receiving team member, and go block the kicker before he travels five yards of the ball? It's downfield. What do you got there? Who wants to chime in on that one? That's a personal foul. That's a uh, that's signal 20. Uh, that's actually signal 40. That's a block below the way signal. So just a little bit unusual type of things. We don't see them much, but those are the right uh, signals you want to use. And OK, go ahead, Robert. I think we're. Going to after the kick now. There we go. All right. So, uh, so remember we have play clock running, so we need to move quickly. You know, after the uh, the the uh, kick play ends, uh, I like to iron cross after the kick is dead because you're going to have a mass substitution no matter what happens. So you may as well iron cross and look over at Team B's sideline so you can see what they're going to be doing. But you need to keep an eye on Team A too because this is a time when you may get an illegal substitution. For example, a player comes in from the bench establishes himself as a player, and then goes right back out. All right? You could have an illegal substitution if he does that. So you got to keep an eye on Team A2 during the substitution phase. Uh, the umpire is going to go to the succeeding spot, and the wing official is going to get him the ball. I don't usually get involved uh, in the relay. I'll usually help actually get the, the uh, kickball out and relay it to the, uh, to the uh, kicking team sideline in that case. Uh, team A has uh, 25 seconds. Uh, to move the ball, all right? So if they want to put it on a hash mark, they got to make that seconds before, the, they got to make that decision before the play clock gets below 25 seconds. Uh, the umpire will come and stay over the ball till I signal them. Uh, the wing officials on both sides, if you guys are out there, make sure you tell your teams to hustle at that phase. They're still a little bit slow getting out. Uh, I've seen both cases where the kick, uh, the, I mean, team A and team B were both slow to get out there. And I had an umpire sitting over a ball, and we had delay of uh, game uh, calls on both the offense and the defense this year. I know the teams and coaches are still getting used to that, but just keep an eye on that. 
Uh, and we discussed uh, kick out of bounds, uh, uh, communicating with the umpire. Just be sure your umpire and your headlinesmen know what you've got. You often have multiple fouls on kick plays. I think we're going to talk about that later on. So be sure everybody's on the same page before you walk it off. All right, Jeremy, why don't you do your part here? I've been talking enough, yeah. right? Uh, that's fine, Jeff. So uh, after the kick, uh, the umpire is going to go press box side uh, to retrieve the ball. And uh, also, umpires, get with your short flanks, because if we have a touchback like Coop alluded to, uh, coaches are just going to say, hey, we want it in the middle, our middle left, our middle right. Uh, you know, your short flanks, they know the position of the ball. So uh, have your... Short flanks communicate with you how you would want to be communicated with. So, hey, we want it on position three. I know that's going to be right in the middle. Hey, we want it on position four. All right, that's going to be uh, in position four. Uh, so make sure you get with them on that. Uh, I think we're going to be talking about penalty. On penalties, always get in the earshot of uh, whoever the throwing official is and the referee. So you know where you're going to be marking the ball off. If it's a spot foul, uh, maybe we're going previous spot. Uh, know where you need to be, hear what you need to hear, and then uh, not walk off the penalty. We're not walking off penalties anymore. We're moving. We're hustling, you know, not hurrying. So uh, always be in the earshot of any type of penalty so you can know what to do, set the ball up. And uh, like Jeff alluded to, whenever we have a, a sub, I forgot to mention this. Uh, of course, during the game or during the pregame, I know my center's name. Uh, I think we are not – in 2020, we can't be within a yard of the center, right? Offenses move very, very fast. So let's say my center's name is Henry or something. I'll get to about within four yards in front of him. I'll give him my hand up. I say, Henry, hey, man, we got a sub. Wait on me. And I've told him this during the pregame. So as soon as my referee gives me the hand to move out, I take two steps back. Now I'm at eight yards. And then I point to Henry and say, hey, man, it's all yours. So opposed to you're within that one yard, your referee moves you back, and then you're jogging backwards to go officiate. And then they say hut, and then you probably miss something that you shouldn't miss, right? And if you miss it, it's going to be on you. So make sure, like, you're in a stationary position to officiate. And uh, I think somebody coached me up on that. And after I did that, I, you know, if I miss something, it's on me, but it's not going to be because I'm moving backwards. That's good advice. Um, Keg. Okay. Uh, for the referee, again, be aware of multiple fouls and free kick plays. It's uh, pretty easy to get caught up there and be sure you know which team committed the fouls. Sometimes it can get pretty confusing. Uh, officials need to report to the referee the who, who fouled, what, what the foul was, when, when did it occur? Did it occur during the kick or the return? And where on the field, obviously, it occurred and, uh, you know, what the enforcement's going to be. Uh, for dead ball fouls, do we have a personal foul or unsportsmanlike conduct? Make sure you separate that and make sure you're ready, you're prepared to announce it. If it's an unsportsmanlike conduct foul, you can announce was it the first or second foul. Uh, use a preliminary signal to make it easier for the press box. Uh, use a dead ball signal if it's a dead ball foul. Make sure you add that in there, but only if that's what it is. Use your communication device, especially on these type of uh, fouls and penalties since you guys are really spread out. And you may, that may be the only way you can really get good communication from your fellow officials. And slow down the reporting official. I know when I was a newer official, one of the bigger mistakes I would make would be I'd get excited when I had a foul. I'd run in there and I'd, I'd report it too quickly to the referee. I wouldn't do a good complete report. Sometimes I'd make errors. So it's our responsibility as a referee, slow it down. In fact, just slow down the whole process. I mean, whenever I've gone back and watched TV games, I just would think to myself, man, it just seemed like we took so long to do that. But when I watch it like this, it, see, it, it took like five seconds. I mean, you got time, and that's our time to shine in a lot of ways, the way we, we, the way we call fouls, the way we enforce the penalty. So we don't want to make errors there. Take your time. Do it slow. Believe me, it's always going a lot faster than you think it is. Uh, 
confirm your enforcement with the umpire and the headlinesman, like we discussed, make the announcement, face the press box, look at just below the press box and make slow signals and announcements, not too verbose. We'll talk about later on where you have to get a little fancy with your calls, but right now I wouldn't do it ad hocly. I would just keep it sweet and to the point and just stand stand back and just uh, give your signals nice and clearly get your arms away from your body when you do it and just exaggerate it almost like, like a, an elementary school kid could see what you're doing. All right, uh, typical fouls during kicks, uh, uh, offsides in the kicking team. Uh, two options uh, for most fouls, uh, they can re-kick or take the uh, yardage at the dead ball spot for Team B, assuming Team B has the ball at the end of the play. What's the one exception here? Who wants to chime in on that one? Kick-catch interference, all right? So that'll be a spot foul. Kick-catch interference is the one exception to that. For kick out of bounds, we discussed only give the coach two options, either a re-kick or tell them which yard line and where, which hash mark the ball is going to be at. You don't have to go and make it too complex and give them all the options. That, uh, they got other things to do. Just make it easy for them. Uh, for uh, illegal block below the waist, for holding, block in the back, during the re- make it during the return if you can. I, I mean, I, I don't know. It's real tough to call that one during the kick. Obviously, that's going to be a previous spot enforcement. Uh, most of those fouls, uh, I, I think they're usually dur- occurring during the return. So it, it should be the exception to the rule. You're going to uh, call that uh, during the kick itself. And make holding big by philosophy. Uh, it, it, on a free kick, it needs to be almost like a takedown if you're going to call it. If they're just getting handsy, let that go. And don't call holding on touchbacks and fair catches if you can avoid it. If it's already been thrown, so be it, but go to the official and maybe say, hey, do you uh, do you want to call this? It was a touchback, or is there a way can, maybe we can wave that one off? If not, call it, but it would be best not to call it if you can avoid that, because you don't have a return, right? So you know the way you're going to have to enforce that's at the previous spot. Uh, kick catch interference, I think we talked about that. It's going to be a spot foul. Wedge formations. Uh, wedge formations are not illegal. We didn't talk about that previously, but if it's an obvious onside kick formation or if the player results in a touchback by rule, you do not have an illegal wedge formation. By philosophy, all right, don't call the foul on a free kick out of bounds or on a fair catch. So those are philosophies, not the rules, but we don't want to have it in those cases either. Okay, Robert, next slide. Here we go. So guys, we're now going to transition from the uh, from the kicking game in, into the running phase and kind of keeping that same flow that we just had. Think about this now as we're picking up the uh, the running phase uh, of the of the game. Jeremy, why don't you start us off here? Yeah, no problem. All right, so uh, my pre snap is uh, I have a a number system. It's three five eight. So my three is for an eligible downfield. My five is for blocks below the waist. And my eight is where I am as far as in front of the ball. Uh, My keys are center guard guard. Uh, I'm in the athletic position as far as pre-snap. Doing whatever I can to make sure I see that the ball is snapped legally. Like I said before, on any type of substitution, I get about four yards in front of my uh, center, and uh, then my referee will release me. Uh, If we have any movement on the center, our two guards, uh, false start, I'll talk about that real quick. Make sure you get with your short flanks and your referee, and I think uh, Jeff and Robert were talking about what they do uh, pre-snap. But if there's movement by those guys, big movement, right? Uh, that's going to be your flag first. That's going to be your flag first. So, uh, and when I'm talking big movement, uh, this is something that somebody coached me up. Make sure if it's on TV, the TV can catch the movement, right? So if it's a hot chew and he sneezes and it's a little bit of movement and there's no reaction from the defense, put your flag away. Don't throw anything because it's going to be incorrect. I know. 
Right. So uh, my pre-snap is three five eight. I'm eight yards in uh, front of the center, uh, doing what I can to make sure that the snap is good. Uh, that's how I am prior to the snap. Uh, Jeff or Robert? Yeah, or yeah, Johnny? yeah, Jeremy. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll take that. So you know, from a referee's perspective, obviously you're at, at a good, comfortable position. You know, my pre-snap distance is about 15 yards, just because it's easy math for me. Uh, get to where you've got a, a good wide angle. Um, um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of philosophies on you know where's the best position. I said where you feel comfortable, uh, but I wouldn't probably get any shorter when seven man mechanics get any shorter than probably 12 to 13 yards. Um, you know, some people go from you know 12 to 13 up to up to 15 yards. I, I tend to work wider so that I can see action on the quarterback that has fewer movements for me so when we see and we feel pressure we'll talk more about that when we talk about the passing game uh, in a few weeks but you know i want to be able to to see the pressure read the pressure and to take as few steps as possible so for me wider is better but prior to the snap uh one of the other things that i think is really important i think it's something that we, we we get into the habit of and and we don't really think about what we're doing is giving this count and signal to our umpire guys what we're signaling as referees is that we have 11 players but there's another part of that in Rule 7 that talks about snapping is that there's a requirement of five players, if it's, if it's a non, uh, not a skirmish kick formation, five players, 50 through 79. And I want to help the umpire as a referee. I want to help the umpire out with that. Um, it's his primary responsibility to make sure we've got that. But I'm sitting there looking at the back of this formation. I'm not having to look through a defensive line. And I just see the, the, uh, the line as they are uh, without any restrictions on, my, on, on the view. So as I hold my... 11 count up i'm also certifying to my umpire that i've got five players 50 through 79 in this formation and it's really important that we do that the other thing too i think is just again this is something that comes with chemistry but working that substitution mechanic with your your uh, your your uh, umpire is really important so coming out of timeouts if we go into the offensive goes into their own bench area uh, it, mass substitutions like jeff talked about earlier I want to make certain that we iron cross. And at that point, the umpire will come up over the ball. At the, at the end of that time, I look to the to uh, the defensive sideline. If they are not making any attempt to try to match up, I'm immediately wave the umpire off the ball. There's no sense holding him up there. So I look, I'm iron crossing. I look to the uh, the defensive sideline. If there's no movement or trying to match up, I push I push the umpire off. That just gets in a good rhythm, good routine for for uh, between the umpire and the referee. The other thing, too, guys, this is about efficiency. Obviously, as we'll talk about this just in the next slide, talking about our pre-snap keys. But obviously, you've got the tackle pre-snap tackle on your side. You know, as, as as I was coming up as a referee, I would see false starts by that tackle, and I, I had help from the wing official, but I would throw my flag. Well, now I just created a a, a situation where now I've got to make the announcement pick up my flag, get back in position. And I created that in kind of a, an efficiency situation, inefficiency situation where now I've thrown my flag. So guys, I'm gonna challenge you. If you see a false start by your tackle pre-snap, um, wait to see if you're gonna get help from your wing official before you throw in the flag. There's really no reason to have two flags in that false start if, we don't, if, we, if we're gonna get help. Um, in, in our conference, uh, the wing officials will really kind of say, hey, that's, that's, that's my guy. I, I'm looking into that tackle. So there's no sense, Robert, you throwing that flag because it just slows us down with penalty enforcement. So I'm challenging myself and I'm challenging each of you guys. If on that, if, we, if you're, if you, if you're going to get help, you know, now if obviously it's a false start and no one throws on it, throw it. And, and if, if the play starts, throw it, still throw it and just stop, shut it down. But there's no sense if we can get away from it than having extra flags down, especially from the referee unnecessarily because it, it just slows down our, our inefficiency. Okay? So we're going to talk a little bit, and, and Jeremy, you know, will kind of walk us through the, the zones. But this is maybe, this may be a, 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 a familiar concept. It may be something that, that's new to you. But we talk a lot about, you know, front side of the play, back side of the play, you know, uh, point of attack or, or on the ball. So what we've done, we've, we've, we've developed this, this numbering, and you'll see that pre-snap, everyone has a, a, a zone. So field judge or side judge, we're going to be the outer zones. The wing officials on the short wings are going to have the, you know, twos and, and, and probably twos and threes. 
uh, or excuse me, twos and fours. And then the referee is going to be looking to tackle on this side. And like Jeremy said, the umpire is going to have center and two guards. This is pre-snap. So as the play starts, so this is pre-snap. Now it's kind of we got a little bit blurry here, but as the play continues, we want our eyes to continue in those zones, but you're not going to stay with a particular stay in that same zone the entire time. So as this play continues or starts, you'll see that the it's actually a sweep play. So the ball is right here. A lot of times like we did on the kick, our our eyes as referees, we want to go right to the ball. As there's there's nothing that's going to happen. There's no foul other than a, a potential face mask. And we're going to have plenty of eyes on that from this action on this ball carrier. Where our eyes really should be is right here. We've got potential. We've got hands to the face. We've got a potential. This, this offensive player could go low. We could have a potential chop block. So, guys, keep work from inside out, not wanting to get to the outside too quick. I find a lot of referees, we want to jump to the outside. We want to jump ahead of the runner or we'll be right on the runner. Guys, go here, stay with this block, and as that block, as that play continues and stretches, let your eyes continue to transition with the ball. So then you'll really come from right here. And as the ball carrier continues to zone five, you're going to be in this area or maybe staying with the, the block back here. Okay, because as you get into the wide zone, you're going to have help from the deep and, and the back judge and also your line of scrimmage guy. Jeremy, you want to take us through kind of this point of attack action from ref, from an umpire's perspective? Yeah, I do. Uh, but before I talk about that, uh, going back to subs, because I know uh, Jeff and Robert, we talked about this. Uh, if your referee goes through the iron cross and we're working substitutions, be reminded and make sure you talk with your referee. Umpire, if you go in there, uh, you're relying on your referee to have that count for uh, the offense, All right? So make sure you guys talk about that during pregame because if you're working sub and you're going in, your referee is going to be counting 11 and allowing you to get back so you can uh, officiate when the ball is snapped. Uh, right, Robert? Yeah, exactly, exactly Jeremy. Hey, I'm going to try to help out with that. And really, you know, a lot of teams, that even doing the muddle huddle, even if it's not the traditional huddle, you can, as a referee, you, you can get a count. And if they bring in a player, you've got, you know, you've got 11 and you've got one coming in, one going off. You've still got 11. So now you're going to rely on your wing officials to make sure the player gets off the field. But exactly right. I'm going to try, I try to, as a referee, try to get that 11 count as quick as possible. And if we have a substitution, let my eyes then drift over to the, uh, to the, uh, the defensive side of the ball, to their sideline. Good deal. So uh, at the snap, and the good thing about working uh, Texas high school football, uh, you working like D1 talent almost every week, depending on your teams. So uh, offensive lines, they really just don't block in place anymore. Uh, a lot of the stuff that we see now is second level blocking. So like, for instance, in this play, uh, if we're looking at zone two or three, that lineman is getting to the second level to make sure he does something to that linebacker, right? And so if anything happens on them, we can't be watching the ball like Robert said. We need to be focusing on two or three. So like Robert said, uh, on three, we may have a hands to the face. Two, depending if, if – let's say it's a pass, we got to make sure uh, that he's not beyond uh, three yards or three and a half or four yards. I would say, and uh, like Coop can attest to, that mechanic is now, or that ruling is now for the short flanks. But if, let's say Coop's looking at your film and he sees that an umpire went five yards beyond, you know, the line of scrimmage, he's not going to say anything to the short flanks. He's going to say, umpire, what were you looking at? This is still your key. This is something that you have to, you know, have a judgment on. Uh, so make sure we're, we're looking at uh, our zone specifically and not worried about the ball. The ball is going to do what the ball is going to do. We got seven guys on the field, so somebody can watch that guy. But uh, if somebody blocks low or somebody clips, that's something that only we can – because on certain plays, only the umpire can see what's going on between those six to eight plays. Like, your back judge may help, or he might not see the whole action. We have to be able to see the whole action. And with that, we have to stay with our keys, uh, especially if they're blocking. And uh, 
whatnot. Coop, do you have anything to add with that? I, 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 I don't. I'm just taking notes because I'm learning so much. You guys are doing a great job. I'm taking notes. I'm going to have something at the end. You guys are doing good. Keep going. So, so this next this next view is really the same kind of the same philosophy, guys. But it, it's it really just emphasizes that as as this play begins to, is beginning to form, that your eyes as a referee are going to go to a, maybe a couple of blocks. You can see there's really here's the ball here, not not threatened at all. You've got a couple of of options. You know, as I look through the back of this uh, ball here and I look to the line, we've got a block here and a block here. Now. The reason I want to probably work this play a little bit, if I if this guy breaks and bounces outside, I want to see if there's any type of restriction right here. We've got a potential. He, his hands are, are right now just outside the frame, but nothing's going on. They're, they're kind of dancing. But if, if this player wants to bounce outside and this lineman then pulls, now we've got some type of a, a, a pull and restrict by this lineman. You know, we want to see that. So, guys, it's not, I guess, what we're, you know, the whole thing right now is, as referees, make sure we get our eyes off of this ball here and to this line play. From an umpire's perspective, Jeremy, you want to kind of talk. And, hey, guys, let me say one other thing. If this play goes away, <laughs> excuse me, it's, it's just in reverse. The umpire is going to have these blocks, and referee, you're going to now have the backside type of blocks. So, if this play were a sweep towards the, the, the top of the screen, Referee, you're not going to go watching the ball. You're not going to have the the, bar, the the blocks ahead of the ball carrier. That's going to be the umpire and his wing official. You're going to now be backside. You're going to be looking for trips, clips, and 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 some type of maybe uh, some type of UNR takedown on the backside. So it, it works both ways. Both of these examples, unfortunately, have been to the referee side. But if the if the ball goes away from the referee, we just we just flip it. So Jeremy, you want to take us through your your mechanic on this? Yeah, so like I mentioned before, uh, the three five eight IDP block below the waist, eight yards is where I'm at. That's exactly where this uh, umpire is. Uh, on this play in particular, you're looking at the point of attack. So where Robert drew that arrow, I'm looking specifically at that block. And if there's a takedown or a reverse takedown, grab and restrict, I have to be able to, uh, you know, see the whole play and make sure if it's a foul or not, right? So uh, if I don't have anything on that one and the runner still continues to go outside, I go with the next block. And that next block is right at the 45. So depending mm -hmm. on where that ball was snapped, right, uh, we may be looking at a potential block below the waist if he goes below the knee. But uh, if he's in and two within that five-yard range, I, I don't have any, have anything on that. So you're going to be out in front of the runner uh, looking at blocks, and we're looking at opposite colored jerseys, right? We don't want to be focusing on uh, a guard just running freely, and then we're focusing in on that guard. That guard's not blocking anymore. We have to look at blocks and make sure these blocks are legal. And so uh, that's what I'm doing. And then uh, Robert said, and, you know, everything correct. If the ball's going on the opposite side, I'm out in front of the runner. I'm looking at that uh, left guard, and uh, I might get an opportunity to look at that left tackle if that left guard and that defensive tackle are doing anything uh, too maybe, right? If I have a grab and restrict on that edge and uh, I get a crack at it, then I'm going to, you know, have a flag on it. But uh, that's something that that short flank will probably see before I do. But like uh, Coop and Jeff and Robert, you want to make sure you see the whole play on everything. If you don't see the whole play and you see a body on the ground and you didn't see everything, you know, that's something that you can just chalk up as you missed or maybe a kid slipped and fell. But if you see the whole play and you see the whole process of the play, the whole process of the takedown, that's when you can have, you know, excellent judgment on whether it's a foul or not. Cool. Yeah, oh, 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 okay. Uh, I'm glad you asked me to come in on this. Sir. So uh, we were talking about uh, the uh, front side, back side, and then I also heard you guys mention something about the, the holding and stuff like that. And so I'm going to defer these comments to later because 
I think when we get into this here, we want to be able to talk about the definitions of holes and things like that. And so I don't want to, no one to get lost. I want this sort of thing to creep along just like it's creeping along. And so the way we do get an understanding of where everyone is. I, I, uh, <clears throat> according to my time, we got 15 more minutes. So I'm going to let Robert determine on when he's going to cut this off because I do, uh, Robert, I do have a couple of things I do want to make sure that we get cleared up with guys. Yeah, this last last slide here, and this is actually Jeff on just dead ball mechanics. And so, Jeff, you want to finish this up and then we'll turn it over to Coop? Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, usually I'll make myself available to uh, relay the ball in, but I don't usually have much of a role if it ends near the line of scrimmage or behind it, usually the, the uh, wing will just send it right into the umpire there. On deep pass plays, though, where the umpire has to go downfield a little bit and help the uh, deep wing uh, get the ball, I'll usually come up to the uh, succeeding spot and plant myself there, let the umpire get the ball and throw it to me, and we're good to go. The umpire can just get in position. I can get in position, and it uh, speeds things up. Uh, substitution process, going into the team bench, uh, I usually don't follow a, fa uh, follow a runner into the team bench unless it's a quarterback. If it's a quarterback, I'm going to go in there and escort him out if he's in the uh, visiting bench. Otherwise, usually the deep wing will take care of that. I don't have to uh, run into the, the bench area. I can stay back, keep an eye on dead ball, officiate, and get ready for the next play and look for substitutions. Uh, Jeremy, you want to comment there at all? Yeah, dead ball mechanics, uh, I'll say this. Uh, as a chapter and as a, a group of officials on your crew, you want to be the best dead ball officials on that field in the state of Texas. So that's communicating with players throughout the play, uh, making sure you have the ball down uh, with the right amount of time. I think it's 32 seconds. Uh, talking to any problematic players. And I mean, like, literally just talking to them so you don't have to throw your flag on a, a UNS you know, in the fourth quarter when it means the most. You want to be talking to these players throughout the game to make sure, hey, man, I see everything that you're doing. And if you're doing something wrong, I'm going to have to flag you. But I'm going to continue to talk you out of anything silly, especially during a dead ball, right? Because that's when things can kind of get fishy. You get guys pushing on guys. Get in between the players. Tell them that, you know, you're not going to have it. Because, uh, I mean, at the umpire position, you're going to be dealing with, you know, 10 of the angriest guys on the field. So make sure your voice is heard throughout the game. All right, going to the next down. You know, I'm going to look at down and distance like we all should be. Uh, confirm there's no fouls. I'm going to start watching Team A for a substitution. Uh, get in position, count Team A, and start communicating with the umpire. Uh, gonna keep my on the same side tackle. Uh, watch the backfield, make sure they get set for one second uh, after the huddle or after a shift, and uh, we're good to go. And uh, let's see, play cl game clock and play mechanics. Uh, at the end of the previous play, we should all be taking a look at the game clock. Let's let's make sure we don't have any mistakes going on. We know the status of the clock, especially in the last minute of a half. Uh, I usually don't look at the play clock, uh, but will sometimes after a free kick just to make sure that uh, that's uh, where that is and make sure that uh, the teams are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, that's pretty much it there. I know we want to move along because we're getting near the end. So next slide. Jeremy? Yeah, what we got, what we got, what we got, what we got. See, so pre-snap and live ball fouls. Oh, yeah, pre-snap and live ball fouls. All right. Uh, communicate with your H and L. Uh, we have a numbering system. So one, one finger whenever we have a foul, that's five. Two is 10. Three is 15. Uh, we're not walking to any fouls. We're, we're moving with purpose. You know, we're hustling. We're jogging right to the spot. I got a system that, you know, that I use. It's hard to articulate. But, you know, if you see me on the field, I'll tell you, how I do it, but uh, uh, on every foul, make sure you're within an earshot of uh, the referee and the call and official. And uh, like Robert and uh, Jeff said before, uh, if you have a foul, make sure 
you announce it to them the way they'll probably say, it, right? You know, the last thing you want to do is say, hey, I got a foul on the red team, number 10. You know, they're going to look at you kind of silly, like, hey, man, what's going on? Uh, just make sure you announce it to them correctly. Uh, so uh, whenever they voice it, uh, it will sound very, very intelligent. And you guys won't look silly as a crew. Jeff? Yeah, well, I want to know that who did it, what did they do, when did they do it, and where did it occur? It's kind of all we need to know. And if you just give us that simple piece of information, we're set. Uh, use the comm device when you need to, but I try not to uh, use it too much uh, for penalty enforcement. Slow the process down. Confirm everything with your umpire and your headlinesman before you walk it off, uh, and make your announcement and make it nice and clear. And again, don't do don't get too verbose, except for the situations we're going to talk about now, which are the uh, the clock special clock situations. So to review the special clock situations, under two minutes to go and a half. If there's a foul by the team ahead or tied in the score that stops the clock, the offended team has the option to have the game clock start in the snap. And that just stops a team from gaming the system, for example, doing false start after false start after false start and getting the game clock winding down uh, with, with a 40-second play clock. So, or a 25-second play clock in that case, I guess. But anyway, it just uh, prevents an unfair advantage. Under one minute remaining in either half, if a foul occurs that causes the clock to stop immediately, and we know what those ones are, the offended team has the option to accept or decline the yardage penalty. If they accept the yardage penalty, they can also select the 10-second runoff. If there's a player injury or helmet coming off, and the only reason for stopping the clock in the last minute of the half as well, the offended team has the option for a 10-second runoff. If they accept it, uh, it will the uh, after the referee signal the clock will start on the ready, otherwise it starts on the snap. So exceptions to those, there's no option uh, for runoff if a helmet came off or an injury on the other team as well. If the helmet comes off as a result of a foul, they don't get the option. Uh, and of course, they can use a timeout. So in any of these situations, if the uh, team that uh, did the offense wants to use a timeout, they can avoid the 10-second uh, runoff. Uh, this is a good time to rely upon your comm system because you can't be at both benches and talk to both coaches at the same time. Uh, it's also a good time to announce details in the microphone. So, for example, you might get a situation like this. You might say, uh, team A committed a false start that stopped a running game clock. Team B, whoever they are, uh, elected to accept the penalty. And by rule, since, it was, since there was less than one minute remaining in the half, they opted for a 10-second runoff. That's it. You're done. You don't have to make it any more complex than that, but you may want to indicate for the press box and the fans what happened. And that's all I got. So, you know, Coop, I know this is kind of your time that we've said questions, but uh, I know that there were some comments that you wanted to make at the end. So, so Coop. Okay, guys, I don't want to hold you guys long because I, I value you guys time with their family. But I I do want to at least uh, throw out some things. And the, the good thing I like about working with these group of gentlemen is uh, I, I, I've gotten to work with Robert before in the past because he's been around. But it's my first time meeting Jeff. And with Jeremy, my thing was trying to get Jeremy to come out of his shell. And he's done an outstanding job of doing so. But uh, I'm going to continue to push him because uh, he's got a great future in front of him as well. Uh, so, but the, the, the thing I wanted to talk about really was quickly, uh, is strictly about everybody doing their job. And uh, it's not enough time for me to address everything I want to address. So at, at some point in some time, I will be back to address some of the things and that's why I'm gonna be taking notes. I'm gonna be taking notes in all of the sessions because when I when I hear things and when I see things and they're not going to what I think that's going to benefit the chapter, I don't care who's presenting or who told our step on guys. Nobody in the chapter have a game to give me, so I don't care about that. I'm going to just speak the truth. And so I want to make sure that everyone is on the same page and everyone is getting to what we need to get to. So uh, just out of the notes I took tonight, 
uh, iron crosses, uh, the banana out there with questions about those things, and also uh, conversations about what we're talking to the centers about in pre-games and things like that. I can tell you real quickly what that is, so we don't have to take that over, is you want to be able to communicate with that center uh, exactly what you want to get done. It's no more than having a, a parent working the chain. You want to be able to communicate with what job you want them to do. And, and for that, as far as that center go, that conversation should be keep your guys in line, uh, take care of me so I can take care of, of your team. And that's not cheating. It's just getting the most out of what you can get out of that individual. Uh, the other thing that uh, I would like to talk about is uh, the, uh, I think we're going to need to spend a little bit more time on front side, back side, uh, and, and to make sure everyone understands that. And also, as well as uh, the holding definition, because so many times guys want to throw holding files, but we need to make sure that when we're calling a holding file, that is what it is. And then the dead ball situation, um, if any of you guys know me, if you're not a good dead ball official, you, you're just not a good official in, in, in most people's eyes. I won't say my eyes, but in most people's eyes. And then the substitution process, I think that the uh, whole chapter is going to have to work on that. And, 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 and I think we'll spend some time with that. And also, uh, I mentioned uh, someone with the Zap 10 and all of that. That's going to have to be a crew thing uh, as well as any, any of this stuff because uh, your side judge may be the best person to know all the rules and understand all of the zap and stuff. And so we want to make sure that we give the freedom to do whatever they want to do within a crew, but we want to make sure that every crew have the opportunity to have success that uh, we so richly deserve to have as football officials. That's it for me, and I think I'm up to the last minute. That's it. I'm through. So, Xavier, uh, th thanks, Michael, uh, for, for that. And we look forward to the, the comments throughout the, all these sessions and, and lean on your wisdom. Um, Xavier, any, any words of wisdom before we uh, adjourn for tonight? Uh, yeah, guys, just a couple of things. Um, just got a couple of announcements and some stuff to go over before next week. Number one is, I don't know if any – most of y'all heard or not, but uh, we did lose two of our chapter members in the last several days. Uh, Robert Van Tenier passed away, as well as Ricky McGee. So please keep their families in your thoughts um, as we keep moving forward. Uh, the second thing is um, this meeting and the recording will be available tonight on the website. Just go to the same spot you went to, and instead of join meeting, it'll say replay session for tonight. Next week, uh, we will continue the training, but we'll move on to the short flanks part of the training. It'll be the same kind of format. So we'll look forward to seeing everybody there. If anybody didn't have any more questions, I think we're pretty much done. Thanks, guys. Thanks, David. All right.